Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Let's open our Bibles to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, starting at verse twenty. <clears throat> Second Chronicles, starting at verse twenty. Let's stand to our feet. Y'all got plenty of rest last night, didn't you? <laughs> Amen. A lot of y'all younger than me. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. Starting at verse 20. Second Chronicles chapter 20, starting at verse 20. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. This is the children of Israel being led by Jehoshaphat. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, and so shall ye prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army to say, Praise the Lord. For his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, they were, they were dead bodies, fallen to the earth, and none escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering of the spoil, and it was so much. And on the fourth day, they assembled themselves into the valley of Baraka. For they, for there, they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of the same place was called the valley of Baraka unto this day. Then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them. To go again to Jerusalem with joy. For the Lord had made them to rejoice over their enemies. And they came to Jerusalem with psalteries and harps and trumpets unto the house of the Lord. And the fear of God was on all kingdoms of those countries. When they had heard that the Lord fought against the enemies of Israel. So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet. For his God gave him rest round about and Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah he was 30 and 5 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem and his mother's name was Azubah the daughter of Shilhai and he walked in the way of Asa his father and departed not from it doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord Howbeit the high places were not taken away for as yet the people had not prepared their hearts unto the God of their fathers. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Jehu, the son of Hanani, who is mentioned in the book of the kings of Israel. And after this did Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, join himself with Ahazah, king of Israel, who did wickedly. Okay? Now, let's go back up. God gave them favor, right? He blessed them, didn't he? Okay, but we go on down and say that he did not take away the high places. The high places. The places of perversion. Where they did wicked things in the sight of God. Where God had told them, don't do that anymore. Now listen, a lot of you all got delivered this weekend. Keep your deliverance. Don't go back to the high places. You want the blessing of God to rest on you. Keep what God gave you. Don't go back. Because see, you'll come out worse than you did when you first came in here. You want to keep what God gave you and build on it. 
Amen. Because he is faithful and just. He will keep you if you want to be kept. But he wants you not to go to the, back to the high places. Those places of worship. Those idols that you held so true and dear to yourself. Because they're what? Familiar. Don't go back to the familiar places. Step out in the realm of God and go with him. Go on this new journey. This new life in him. Give up everything that you once used to hold on to. Forgiveness visited y'all this weekend. It visited me. Yesterday, y'all didn't get anything. I did. Lord have mercy. I did. Even this morning, woke up, had to get up out of bed. Still going through deliverance. I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. It never stops. It never stops. So don't go back to the high places. He's given us victory over our enemies. That's right. Wherever your enemies were, he's giving you victory over them. A lot of y'all can't see that you got enemies out there, but they ain't your enemies. They don't love God, they can't love you. That's Amen. Right. Amen. So let's rejoice this morning. Yes, he told the singers to sing. Yes. Did he not? Yes, yes, the first thing he opened up with. Did he not? Yes, yes. yes, he did. He said, when they begin to sing to praise the Lord, yes. the Lord set ambushments against the children of Adam, Ammon. These yes. are against his enemies. Ambushments mean that they somewhere hiding to attack them. So that's what we're doing this morning. We're setting out ambushments. Don't worry about no retaliation. We already going to take care of that this morning because it's been set up as we begin to sing. Amen. Amen. Y'all believe it? All right. We're going to sing like it this morning. Y'all rejoice in the Lord. I believe it. Amen. Get a Lord of praise off in there. Act like you do. Let him know you do. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, he did. Thank you, Lord. He has given us victory over our enemies. Wherever we go, wherever our feet tread, that he has done it. Amen. I thank the Lord. I know y'all look like y'all sleeping and tired this morning. Y'all shake that off of y'all this morning. Get it off of you right now in the name of Jesus. Shake yourself. Amen. Shake yourself. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God is good. Amen. I like that, Marcus. He is a jumping jack. I tell you, I used to jump like that. <laughs> I'm going to get it back. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Go ahead, Brother Tim. Oh, wait a minute. I got to pray. He said, you got to pray. <laughs> I'm excited this morning. Thank you, Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. Y'all join hands in here. We're going to unite this thing up this morning. Amen. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> thank you lord thank you lord everybody touching and agree he said well two well but two or three are in his name he's gathered in the midst amen amen, amen. take, take right. yeah thank you lord now we got it all sold up thank you jesus father god in the name of jesus we thank you for this day we thank you lord god for the holy spirit holy spirit we welcome you here this morning we don't know what you're going to do. We don't care what you're going to do, but we know you're going to do it. Have your way. We move out of your way, Lord. You do whatever you want to do, Lord God. You know, we just give it over to you. We get this flesh out the way and we let you have your way, Jesus. And Father, we thank you for it right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And we give you all the praise, the honor, and glory. And it's in Jesus' name we ask and we pray. Amen. Amen. He got it done. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have your way, Holy Ghost. Do whatever you want to do. In the name of Jesus. It don't take him long. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We yield to you, Lord. We yield to you, Before Jesus. Before we hug each other, I want all the children to come up front. We need to pray for the body of Christ. We need to pray for the children. Bring Parents, bring your children up. Bring your children up. We need to pray for these children. Amen. 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 Stand right across here. Mallory, stand with your babies across here. Stand right behind the speakers, y'all. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hey, hey.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We intercede and pray for these children yes. every night. And we pray. The intercessors continually pray for the children because these are our future. We know we're living in the last days, but we also understand the war that the devil has issued against children because he's recruiting. That perverse spirit is recruiting right now. And through education, through TV, through all media points, he is after the children because they're, they're innocent. They're innocent. So if he can put a seed down in them now, see, he come in them, you know, as them, and he wants to live through them when they become adults. See, they, those spirits grow up with them. So parents, if your relationship with the Lord is not tight, you better make that decision today to get it tight because these children are in danger. I had a dream about EJ last night. This morning after I went back to sleep after intercessory prayer, somebody had shot EJ. And I said, Lord, I said, what is it? He said, pray for them. Pray for all the children that they be protected from the wiles of the devil. So, Dad, you got to get in place. Mom, you got to stay in place. Don't let the devil in your house. Whatever differences it is, it don't matter because they after them. This is who they're after. It ain't about you. It's about them. Okay, so that's where the Bible is telling us, train up a child in the way they will go. And when they get old, they won't depart from it. It doesn't matter how old they are. I got grown old children still believing to see their salvation because it's done. Because I believe it. Amen. 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 So, Father God, you all that are out behind them, raise your hands towards them in the name of Jesus. SJ, get up here with your boys. Let SJ through. Thank you, Lord, because they're precious in God's sight. He said, lo, children are the heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of your womb is his reward. The fruit of the womb is his reward. These, are, these children belong to the Lord. They belong to him. Amen. Amen. And, Father, I thank you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I curse every demonic stronghold, principality power that want to do something to this baby, Lord God, to EJ, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. We curse it in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you right now. We plead the blood of Jesus over him from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And Lord God, we thank you for keeping him. No weapon shall ever prosper, Lord. Oh God, we thank you today, Lord God. That you keep him, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Keep his mind, Lord. Keep his mind, Father God. Keep his mind. But Father God, we pray over all these little ones, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And Father, we lift them up to you today, Lord God. We give them back to you, Lord God. Father, they only came through their parents, Lord Jesus. But Father, we know, Lord God, the mission and the journey they will go on, Lord God. Oh God, we thank you for keeping them, Father God. Keep them close to your heart. While they sleep, Lord God, you minister to them. We bind every satanic force, principality, power, ruler of darkness, and spiritual wickedness, Lord God, in high places that want to keep them capped off, that want to cap them off, Lord. We reverse, Lord God, any interaction with any perverse spirit, Lord God, to this day, Lord God. We reverse it in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for keeping them. Keep them, Lord. We plead the blood of Jesus over their households, Lord God. Everything in that house that's not pleasing to you, Lord, that's ministering to them, Lord, open the eyes of the parents to see it, to see it, Lord God, and to get it out of those homes, Lord God. Don't let them watch certain shows. Quicken the parents, Lord God, to let them see what they're being ministered to, Lord God, what the devil is ministering to them, Father, in the name of Jesus. Open their eyes, Lord God. Open our eyes, Lord God. And let us see, Father God. Open our ears and teach us to listen, Lord God. Father God, open us up, Lord. Protect these little ones in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you for it right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now give everybody a hug in here. Show them some love and tell them, I need you. I need you in the body of Christ. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
Thank you, Lord. Give me a hug, Jeremy. Love you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Hey, Brother Banks. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. No running and playing in here. No playing in the church, children. Go sit down. Go find your mom and your daddy. Go find your parents. Don't play in church. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come out there and hug somebody. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Ain't that silly? We need to put our mics up. All right, how's everybody doing? All right, we're on the last leg here. It's the last day of this time, but you never know. What may down what may be down the road a piece, right? Today we're talking about a family reunion, so you never know what the future holds here dealing with God because he's always up to something. All right. Before we get going, I got a, a few announcements here. First of all, uh, Shiloh Christian Academy will give each family with children ages 10 and under a copy of Levi James' book, Friendly Fruit. Please see a Shiloh team member for your copy. We will be giving away any remaining food items from the hospitality suite immediately following lunch. So if you're driving back home or something and you want to snack along the way, we're going to give away uh, any remaining food items in the, um, in the uh, hospitality suite. Also, Shiloh Christian Academy will host weekly children's devotionals beginning in September, as well as a family movie night in October. Stay tuned for more details on how to join. We will have a memory verse competition based on the memory verses in the workbook children received on Friday. So be sure to study. Thank you. So that's the stuff coming up with Shiloh. You know, all of our teachers are certified teachers. They've held positions as principals and assistant principals and things of that nature. So we're trying to build an army of educators that can uh, unify to teach these kids because the, the public school system especially is becoming contaminated and even is bleeding into Christian schools. You got to watch that Christian title on a school because a lot of that stuff is not Christian. Especially when they start teaching karate and stuff like that. They'll have yoga classes, all kind of stuff going on in supposedly Christian schools. And you got to beware. And you know, a lot of witches and warlocks infiltrate Christian schools. They infiltrate churches. I mean, they don't just step back from you because you say you're saved now. Because the devil stepped up to Jesus and he's the son of God. So why would he step back from us? <laughs> See what I'm saying? You got to be aware of your environment because the devil's always circulating trying to do you in and that joker doubles back over and over and over and over and over again because you might be strong on monday but you could be weak by friday so you you, know, you got to keep checking you out now so uh it's a constant warfare all right next i'm gonna tell you about the um the normal books we always talk about, the organic gospel, and the Jesus Cult book. These are books we wrote. Jesus Cult was written back in 2001. But it's a, it's a timely book for today in that it uh, details the fact that there's another Jesus in the Bible. If you never find out about the other Jesus, you'll walk around basically unarmed in church because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse uh, 
uh, verses 4 and following, that there's another Jesus, another gospel, and another spirit. So there's counterfeits. So you better know the real one so that all the fake ones don't get you. So you got to know through studying your word. We do things like uh, the Bible quiz and things of that nature, like the game we played last night, to instill in people the necessity for studying. Because a lot of folks go to church, but they don't read the Bible. You're a sitting duck. Because you believe, if you believe everything coming across a pool pit, you're already through. They can mail you home because you're already done. Like they say, you might as well just get those biscuits out of the oven. They are done. Because if you sit in a church and you just depend on somebody else to tell you the truth and know what's right, man, you can be set up. So when you meditate on the word, what happens to it, it actually, it actually goes into your subconscious down in the deep levels of you that you don't know about. And the Holy Ghost has a way of tapping into it and pulling it up. And you'll be quoting stuff that you didn't even know that you knew it. And you, you get through talking to somebody and say, where in the world did that come from? You have put it in you. You just weren't conscious of it. But the Holy Ghost can call to remembrance the things you need. Jesus promised that the Holy Ghost would do what? Call all things to your remembrance. But how can he make you remember what you never memorized, what you never put in? You got to put it in. And so you got to understand, if you've been around a long time, you know the tricks of the treacher uh, witchcraft trade. I was going to say it's a trade, but it's a craft you know the tricks of the craft, how they manipulate people, and they, they enter in through your emotions. You know, coming through your emotions is illegal entry into you. If somebody infiltrates your emotions that came in illegally, they're a thief and a robber. Because God calls deep to deep. He talks from spirit to spirit. And from your spirit, he communicates with your, your soul and your mind. So if somebody gets you worked up emotionally, they can get inside of you and make you feel things and start getting you emotionally worked up and getting you all, you know, crying and running and jumping and turning cartwheels. And then they'll empty your pockets because they made you emotional. I always tell women, don't let your emotions be the leading edge. Because the Bible calls those women silly women. Led away by what? All kinds of diverse lust. All kinds of desires leading you. It's not the spirit. It's your diverse lust. And these old pimp preacher, punky wimps, they have uh, perfected actually ministering to, to the egos in women. You know, call them apostle and bishop and prophetess and evangelist and putting them in positions. And See, that's how they do it. They get you over there and make you believe that you're a charismatic Oprah in the church. You know, and they put you out there and make you believe you're a Star Wars missionary or whatever they're calling you. Bring you up and give you all kind of stuff and introduce you, let you have the service. And, and all they're doing is building a network of deceived folks. And uh, when you're trying to be something you're not called to be, they can exploit you. You know, Juanita Bynum tried that and got beat up in the parking lot outside of uh, the Marriott Hotel in Atlanta. Getting up with old wimpy, weak, effeminate dude who beat her down like an animal in the parking lot. So you got to understand when you jump out there trying to do something you shouldn't be doing, you open up a door to the devil, and the devil exploits it. You know, I, and I'm not one of these folks that's against women and what they do. But you got to come correct. There is protocol in the household of God. There is protocol in the family of God. If you bypass proper protocol, you're going to be in a delusion. So you got to know the protocol. You can't walk into a throne room with a king and just come in looking crazy issuing commands and making requests you got to come right so you got to be taught the proper protocol so get a copy of these books they'll help you in your study time the organic gospel and the jesus code and also the organic gospel is in the process of being translated into spanish so we're going to look to get that done in the next couple of months so we'll be looking for the spanish version of the organic gospel to come out and it'll help you reach hispanic people also, uh, Maxie wanted me to tell you, you what time are you leaving? Uh, Route to servants. He's headed back to Tampa, so he said anybody that needs to go to Orlando Airport, that he can take how many people? Maybe two or three? Two or three, depending on how much luggage you got. If you brought like eight bags of Samsonite <laughs> or something, 
you probably depended on Uber or something like that. <laughs> but he said he got room because he's driving an SUV, right? So he can take some people back. If you get with him, he's right there. Raise your hand. Anybody need a ride? There's one. There's two. Anybody else? There's a couple of people, right? You see them? So y'all just get together after service. He headed that way into the Orlando airport if you're leaving today. It's hard for me to just do all this and then leave. I got to stay about a day or two, man, just to go to the beach and fool around, you know. <laughs> Look crazy for a minute. <laughs> then I go back and get into the warfare back at, uh, in Atlanta. All right, let me see what else I got up here. Remember prayer, we go on back, you know, we, we never stop praying. 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time every night, seven days a week is prayer. Join the prayer line. Many, a lot of folks get help on the prayer line. I'm serious. And we pray all the time, 8 o'clock every night. That number is 712-770-5603, 712-770-5603, and the access code is 409-367-POUND. Pray every night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, except for Wednesday when we play, pray at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time following Bible study. So that's the exception. Nine o'clock on Wednesday, following Bible study. Every other, other night is 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join an intercessory prayer. We pray for anything and everything. Anything you got on the table, you got all these saints agreeing with you, which adds volume and adds power to your prayer. You know, the more the merrier. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. God can hear real good when you're praying. It might seem like you don't hear nothing you're saying. But God can hear real good, but he can't answer you on your timetable and the way you want him to. Because sometimes to save somebody, you got to break them down. So, you know, usually they go south first when he's working on them. They're going to look worse. So you can't be all, Lord, they're... no, just relax and let the, put them on the altar, leave them there. Stop trying to run back to the altar and get them off, you know, let God work. So join the prayer line. Also remember on Wednesday mornings, we have the women's Bible study every Wednesday morning. That's at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Got different teachers teaching the word in the women's Bible study. It's not just restricted to women, but women teach it, and it's aimed at women and their growth. So join that teaching. It'll be Barbara teaching or Melanie or Tan Prelo or whoever, Naomi. And others to come to teach us, they get ready to do it, you know. Because we don't hold folk back now. As they get equipped and get ready, time for them to go. And you don't have to teach here. You can teach your own Bible study at work. And uh, if you live in an apartment complex, I know they got a clubhouse. Post it on the apartment in, uh, at the post office. Uh, post offices, you know, the little boxes there. I'm conducting Bible study on Thursday night at 730. And you, you, if you begin to feed folk and let it flow through you to help somebody else, what God is going to do is refurbish you and refill you because you're giving out. It's nothing worse than to let it get dammed up inside of you and you begin to get fat on the word and, it, and you know stuff that sits out or sits around a long time, if it's organic, it will rot. So if you got an organic word in you and it's getting inside of you and it's not being released, it's going to get stale. That's why people get bitter, resentful, uh, anxiety stricken, depressed, roots of bitterness spring up. And what happens in churches when they just stay on the word, they begin to bite and devour each other, the Bible says. And you should have been out there saving somebody, but you set up in an old rusty church, sitting up in a pew, listening to sermons all the time, but you never gave out. We're looking for people to become evangelistic and to become harvesters to get a job done. You got to get in this thing. Don't let anybody make you a pacifist and doubt your salvation and hold you back. You got to be right now. You got to get delivered. You got to get through with the world. You got to come in right and mean business. But once you go through the process, God does not want you to sit around and be unproductive in the church. So that's what it's all about. Also, the men have the man up meeting on uh, Thursday evenings at seven o'clock. The man of meeting is designed to forge men into leaders. It's all about leadership. Our moniker is honor, honor, holiness, our number one responsibility. If you're going to be a man, you've got to be holy. If, you gotta be, if you're going to be a man, you've got to be a leader. If you're going to be a man, you've got to learn how to compliment and supplement women. 
Because if you don't know how to do that, you'll, you'll be out here as an unfit leader and an unfit example. You know, that's the way it goes. See, a lot of uh, younger guys especially coming out of the hip-hop world, they got to be retrained how to be a man because that world right there is just full of a bunch of laid-back, rusty, raggedy kind of folks. I'll give an example of what I mean. There is no woman that wants to go to a formal affair like last night in an evening gown with her nails done and hair done, you know, went shopping and got her stuff together, she got her outfit together, and you come in with, with some tennis shoes on and a t-shirt. They might not tell you that because you're so pitiful that they can't bring themselves to tell you you look like a complete teetotal fool. <laughs> so they won't tell you, but they'll be thinking it. She's sharp as a tack, dressed to the nines, but you don't know how to compliment her. See, coming out of this generation, <clears throat> you think looking like Lil Wayne is dressed up. <laughs> Back was cap on. See, they think that's my opinion. This is not my opinion. I don't care how old she is. She can be 13 years old. She can go be 17 years old going to a senior prom. She's going to tell that dude, you ain't taking me in that. First of all, she checked, what you going to wear? <laughs> I was just going to wear some jeans. And, you ain't going with me. <laughs> You're going to compliment what I got on. We're going down to the tuxedo shop together. I'm going to tell you what you're going to put on. So they'll do all that behind the scenes, see. And then the joker need to go get a haircut with him, get all those crazy nap knots out of his head. See, all that stuff, man, is just the devil. You, you might not think it's the devil, but it is. How do I know that? 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. That's what the Bible says. But don't nobody want to read that. See, what you don't like, you skip over. We skip over nothing. He said to eat what? The whole row. You got to eat the whole Bible. So we got to be an example to the world to show the world what God is like. We don't downgrade it to accommodate them. If you want to be saved, you got to come over here. We're not coming over there. Period. That's the way it's got to go down. And the leading edge of this has to be men who have been forged into disciplined guys that know the way of God so they're fit to lead. That's what we're all about in the Man Up meeting every Thursday, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's on Zoom, and we usually post it on all of our websites. You'll find it on the Facebook pages, which are uh, Omega Ministries. You'll find it on the Man Up Leadership page. You'll find it on the Omega Ministries Warrior page. There's a lot of different pages out there that you'll find it. That's on. Oh, it's kind of hot in here. Anybody? Is the air conditioner on? Oma. Are y'all hot? Yeah, they, they can turn it down. And they got to do it with a computer, I think, right? All right. Yeah, they'll turn it down. Get some air circulating before y'all pass out up in here. <laughs> Let me see what else is going on. I think that's it. Anybody got anything else? Yeah, we got Levi going to come up and tell us about his book. This is the author, Mr. Levi. Levi James. Come on up, Levi, and tell us about your book, man. You know, Levi has a song on YouTube, too. Have y'all heard Levi's song? What's the name of your song, Levi? Cover the Sea. Oh, Cover the Sea. Man, Levi, Levi ain't nobody to play with, man. Y'all think Levi's somebody to... Y'all better be careful with Levi. Let me get your microphone, Levi. This is Dana, Tim. So this book is written by me. It's called The Fruits We Eat and How They Behave. And this book teaches about the fruits of the spirit of how they live in their town and the gifts that God has given them. And so this book teaches children to learn appropriate honoring nouns such as Mr. and Mrs. Learn about the fruits of God's spirit in a fun and practical way and understand the, match, the nature of God and his son, Jesus Christ, on an elementary level, of course. And so you can buy this book on my website called friendlyfruit.net, and it's sold for $10. You can get it for a set of one, three, and five. So, yeah. 
<laughs> Dave Lieber. Hey, Brett. Lay in the gym, i Levi James. <laughs> How old are you, Levi? Eleven. Got what? Oh, it, it said it got a few copies back on the back table, too, if you want one right now. So, hey, support Levi. Because he's he he not just listening, he's he taking it to heart. And Levi's stepping up to the plate. And we also have a publishing company now, Remnant Publishing, ran by Vinny. That's, um, if you know Maisha, Maisha had the, um, the blog, Latter Days blog. She passed away, how long ago? 2017. And like, Maisha lives on through her, web, her uh, blog. And she was an integral part of um, Omega Ministries. As a matter of fact, she helped me write um, the organic gospel. She did all the editing and all the things that that are um, necessary to write the book. But her husband, Vinny, he is the, run, is the head of the publishing company. Now, it used to be them together, but now it's just Vinny by himself. But we publish books. So if you got a book that's down in your soul that can help somebody, just contact us and Vinny can take you through the publishing process. We know all them pathways to take. Now, it can't be crazy because <laughs> we got to proofread it and all that. And we'll tell you, well, you know, this kind of off right here, you know, your doctrine is crazy. You got God as a, you know, Martian or something like that. That ain't, that ain't it. But uh, if it's valid, you know, we can publish it. And uh, normally we, on our books, we print about 5,000 copies leading in. But, uh, and you, we try to get them to distributors. But if you're telling the truth, you find it's a blockage for distributorship of books. Now, if you're lying... They'll put, they'll put them out there all day. But if you tell the truth, man, you find a little cholesterol is in the, in the body. That's how it goes. Though. So we put it out there for people. And sooner or later, I believe God's going to turn on the real, though. If you just hang around long enough, normally when times get real bad, folks don't feel like playing anymore. And they get for real. But while they can play, they don't, you know, they don't, they try to blow the truth off. But, buddy, when times get real bad, you start looking for what's real and authentic. So God is letting it just, you know, get so bad that it finally look for what's true. So that's what we're going through right now. We just got to wait them out. They're going to they're gonna turn. A lot of folk you think thought they would never get saved, they're going to get saved. They look terrible right now, but just wait. They'll turn. But first, they got to take that beat down. You know, people tend to try everything but God until all they have is God. Then they'll come to him. That's how it goes, though. So don't, don't be... Shook up, you know, especially looking at your kid. You look at your kid, you look like, I don't know where. I don't know where they came from. I don't know what that is on them. And you're thinking, I didn't raise, I didn't raise that. But there's a world out there. You didn't see what was sitting next to them in school. They had crazy sitting next to them in school, see. Now they on drugs. Now they out there acting crazy, wilding out, staying out all night talking back to you, flexing on you. And a lot of boys, if you're raising a boy as a single mother, they're going to try to flex on you because they're going to figure out by the time they're about 12 or 13, I'm bigger than you and I'm stronger than you. And you can sit there, you still, you still beat them and stuff. They're, just, they're looking at you. You through yet? Because <laughs> you don't phase them anymore. So most women then shift over to emotional blackmail and witchcraft. Don't do that because now you... In a, in a bad spot with God because you can't manipulate people and try to influence them through witchcraft to do your bidding because now you're a witch. So you trying to get something done switching over to witchcraft because you got a boy that's stronger than you puts you in the realm of the flesh and witchcraft is a work of the flesh. You got to stay the course with God and let God run this train. Don't look at your surroundings because your surroundings look terrible. That's why you walk by what? And not by so you can't just quote that now. Most folks say it and they walk right by sight. You won't make it to the lobby 
before you done slapped your kid upside the head <laughs> because, because he was a sight problem. You know, you got, you got to be for real with this. You know, you can't just say it. All right, let's see here. I think that's it. Anybody got anything else that I'm missing? Huh? Oh, yeah, the uh, QR cards on back that have been done by Mark. The QR cards are back there. They're free. Get as many as you need because they're a good evangelistic tool. Talk to folks and then see everything we do is designed for our website to be evangelistic for you to use it. All the messages, 1,400 messages. All the books, QR codes directing them to different messages. Some of the QR codes have messages in them where they can scan their phone over the QR code. The message will come up for them to listen to it on their phone just by scanning the card. See, everything is user friendly. We try, we're, we're still designing stuff to be user friendly because our goal is evangelism. We're looking to push it forward. And uh, that's why we have these, these meetings. We don't have meetings just to have meetings. We have meetings to get people ready to go and to get you on the same page with everybody else. So everybody's saying the same thing. Everybody has the same belief. Everybody sees it relatively the same. There's always going to be variations of what people believe. There are personal choices that nobody can influence you on. You know what I'm saying? The, the Bible says if, if you eat something, you know, eat it unto the Lord. If you eat it not, you eat it not to the Lord. I mean, if you want to be vegan, that's you. Look, you're not going to put me in bondage. I'm not putting you in bondage. This is me. This is what I do. Nobody can influence that. Nobody can step into that. Folk beat me down about drinking a glass of wine. They try to make me see, I don't touch a drop of liquor. <laughs> I was an alcoholic. In the, I wasn't an alcoholic in the world. <laughs> I like a little Chablis with my, with my fish dinner. My, I got some sea bass here and I little, need a little Chablis. Look at him. I told you it was the devil, a false prophet. <laughs> He's teaching them to be drunkards. That's how people come at you, man. You can't, if I can get drunk off a glass of wine, I'm a pitiful soul. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's a dinner wine, man. And then they try to tell you that Jesus turned water into grape juice. <laughs> that wasn't grape juice because you don't save the best grape juice to last. <laughs> they brought out the, the, the rusty stuff last because the folk were lit. So they could drink that old nasty stank wine after drinking the good wine first. And then they brought the old rusty nasty stuff out. You know, the, the, the boom farm used to drink. That boom farm and that white lightning and that stuff that you and your high school buddies got. When y'all had like $3.75 and the whole bottle, bottle called $3. Y'all don't know nothing about that, do you? Y'all don't know nothing about that, do you? I forget all the name, boom farm. MD 2020, all that stuff, they'll be done right at your guts out, MD 2020. Mad Dog 2020. Are you for real? You were, we were crazy drinking that stuff. But all you trying to do is get drunk. Yeah, like I said, get your head right to do the crazy stuff you were doing. But, see, don't let people bind you. Folk, folks are always trying to bind somebody. Did you know that in church, some people, their number one objective is to bind folks. If they see you getting free, they respond to your freedom to try to put you back in a cage. Don't let folk bind you, man. That's not what it's about. God sets you free because he only flows through freedom. Folks are not going to be drawn magnetically to bondage. They're already in bondage. So don't try to get them to come over to bondage to set them free. You've got to deal with them right where they are and let them see the real dictates of walking with God. A lot of stuff we do, people come around us and get, they was in there doing a line dance. I left after that. I got my stuff and left. Line dance, man. Wasn't nobody twerking or nothing like that. Wasn't nobody twerking. But see, that, that religious church world would get you so messed up that you, you are more holy than God. I'm holier than God. Now, that's crazy. You got to really know him, get to know his nature, his character, and walk with him as a child of God. Man, that'll set you free. All right, let's see here. I think that's every, that's not everything, but that's what I'll cover today. 
All right, let's get into the word for today. We're talking about a family reunion. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time of sharing. Thank you for the word of God that's able to save our souls. God, manifest your presence again here, God, as you always do. I know you will. Let these words fall on good ground and produce fruit a hundredfold. We're not looking for 30 or 60. We need a hundredfold return on fruit, on fruit and because we've sown good seed into good ground. We want to see people go on and live. We've been bound long enough. We've been limited long enough. We've been held back long enough. It's time to progress forward and see God's glory manifested in the earth. Bring in these lost souls. Introduce them to Jesus Christ and see them live for the first time in their lives. We always tell people, live. You are commanded by God to live. So God, do it. Set at liberty everybody that's bound, everybody bruised, open prison doors. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Talking about the family reunion, a family reunion. Look at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20, verse 11. He says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. According to your work, you'll be judged according to your works. You're not saved by works, but you're judged by works. And these are the works of the spirit through you. So you're going to be judged according to how much you yielded your body to the spirit. That's what's going to judge you. Did you yield your members to the Holy Spirit to use you? And you do the works of the spirit. As many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So you're going to fall under judgment based on your ability to yield to God, to use you. Those are the works of the spirit through you. So you're judged according to your works. Now, what he's talking about is not salvation, but there's going to be a stratified judgment given to us. And everybody won't get the same reward. So you got to understand, you don't want to just drag in to be a heavenly janitor or something like that. You know what I'm saying? You want to come in hot. You want to come in red hot to get your full reward. So you need to find out what you are individually called to do and get on with it. Stop following other folk and stop trying to mimic other folk. And for God's sake, stop envying other folk. Because when you envy somebody, let's say you envy somebody that's a billionaire. And God wanted to make you a multi, multi, multi billionaire. And you stuck on this person with one billion dollars. He's going to give you a hundred billion. You see how silly that is? You can never envy somebody else's position because you never know what he has for you. So don't get hung up watching folks because, man, you may be 20 times better off than them. You got to get out of the flesh and get away from looking at people and just seek the Lord for you to get your reward. And what do you have for me? And boy, maximize that and you're going to be content. So you see now, you're judged according to your works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's a promise. Now you stand on the promises of God. That's a promise. If your name is not in the book of life, he's going to throw you into a lake of fire. See, the Bible says you got to know the severity of the judgment of God, too, now. We know it's love and it's compassion, but there's also severe judgment meet, met, uh, meeting us if we don't measure up to the standards of God. So it's a casual, chaos gospel down here that's super grace-based, whereby, you know, God, Jesus paid it all. I don't have to do anything. I can stay like I am. I'm still accepted by God no matter what I do. That's a lie. Grace teaches you. Grace moves you on. Grace is time for you to do what? Change. Grace is time to change. He got you in this thing filthy. Then he washes you and regenerates you and changes you. Without the transformation, 
you won't be fit for the master to use you and cohabitate with you inside of your physical body. You got to start seeing yourself as a vessel. You are not the physical you. That's going to return back to dust from whence it came. You got to begin to see yourself as the spirit that lives within you. And then from that perspective, you can see out of your eyes and see correctly because you won't be seeing yourself as just your physical body. See, that's going to undermine a lot of folks. I'll show you how that's undermining folks right now. I'll show you in just a minute. So you got to start seeing yourself as a spirit in a body with a soul. Your soul expresses your spiritual intent from the inside out. In other words, your spirit has an intention. It comes through your soul and your body expresses it. You can tell what a spiritual uh, uh, intent is or some type of condition sometimes just by the look on somebody's face. You look sad. Why are you so happy? They ain't said a word. But you're picking up what? The spiritual condition inside of them by physical manifestations. So you got to know that. You got to see yourself as a spirit and not as a flesh, a fleshly being. If you do that, you'll always walk around like a pint short of a gallon. You'll never have the full picture about what life is about. All right, so you see now, this is a gathering and a judgment day here in Revelation chapter 20. God is about to culminate his whole entire plan, which is he did everything he did to get a family. God is after a family. He began the process eons ago by creating the servants for the family, the angels. See, the angels don't bear the express image of God. Humans do. That's the family members. He created the servants first, and a tear of the servants rebelled, and evil came into being. So now the father of spirits, he filters every spirit through evil to get to him. See, what we go through down here is the filtration process taking us through evil to try us to see if we maintain righteousness, faithfulness, if we're faithful to the father of spirits. Since evil exists, God filters his family members through the evil. Why did he do that? See, God is good. But if God is good, by necessity, the ability for evil to exist must exist. If you got a right hand, what has to be in existence? At least the potential for a left hand. You see what I'm saying? If you go out the door, the potential to come in the door exists. So whenever you got one thing, the opposite and the potential of it existing has to be there. If there's a right, there has to be a wrong, potentially, even if you never saw it. So if God exists as a righteous being, evil is always potentially around. But you have to have somebody do what? Rebel against righteousness. For the opposite to come into being, somebody has to become the opposite of God. And that's what Lucifer did. He rebelled against what was righteous and he fell into evil. He's consummate evil. The devil is evil. But he, he, he came into this evil from rebelling against that which was holy and righteous. The potential was always there, and God knew that. People said, did you think, you think God knew the devil was going to, yeah, he knew everything the devil was going to do. Well, why even make him? Now, have you ever thought, have you ever said a thought sometime like, why did you even make all of this mess? I mean, we could have been just, why was I even born to go through this? You know, this don't even make sense. He's after a family. He's, after, he's always been after a family. Why does God want a family? He wants to fellowship with them. Why does he want to fellowship with people? He loves people, like people. He's just a person that likes people. I just want to hang around people. Everybody has more fun in a group. God is not far removed from me and you. He'll let just like you if you become righteous and get rid of the sin. You'll be basically just like him. God will laugh. There's a lot of things that Jesus would do if he was here that you, you wouldn't think he'd do. He'll run out in the ocean, jump around with your kids, 
throw a football around with you, fool around with you, eat hot dogs and stuff like that. He's not far removed from a human. He came to earth as a human. He is a God man. So if you put Jesus in a place where he's so far removed that you can't identify with him, you'll have a perverted view of him. And you won't walk with him correctly because you're so scared of him. And you won't, you know, interact with him in a normal way because you're trying to be religious and he's not religious. So you got to level out how Jesus is. You know, people start thinking things about the Lord that's just not even in play. So you got to kind of get rid of that religious yoke on folks. You know, what you do when you're like that, you're overcompensating for your sin. You got a sin consciousness. So you're trying to make amends for all your sin. And then instead of repenting, you do penitence. See, Roman Catholics teach you to do penitence. Where you have to say three Hail Marys after you, conf- you go to confession first. Then they say they'll give you, they'll say three Hail Marys, two Our Fathers, and three acts of contrition. And you go and make your sign of the cross. <laughs> Knowing good and well, you're going to go do the same thing tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to be lying and fornicating and drunk and smoking some dope, but Hail Mary full of grace, the Lord is with thee. See, that's crazy. You see how crazy that is? We're involved in crazy, insane activity and appending some meaning to it, and God doesn't even know it exists. So you got to be delivered from this stuff. It's harder to deliver people from religious programming than it is to get like a drunk or a stripper saved. Religious programming is hard. Because they append what? Meaning to it. They append some type of a holiness to it. They they append some kind of righteousness to it and it's not even in play. So you got to be delivered from all of that stuff. It's a yoke around your neck. And when you get free from all of that, you'll be able to save a lot of people. Our intention is for you to save a lot of people. I mean, there's 180 people registered for the conference. That could easily be a couple of thousand people by the next time we have one. If you just get out of yourself, if you can ever break free from self, man, you'll be free indeed. Because I guarantee you probably 80 to 90 percent of your problem. If you got problems, 80 to 90 percent of the the, at the root of your problems is the fact that you think about yourself. If you begin to pour into somebody else, God will take care of your problem. But because you're selfish, you lock him up. That's why, like, if you don't forgive, you can't be free because what you're doing, you're carrying that unforgiveness as a ball and chain on your own soul. You got a person you won't forgive dragging you down inside. But if you let them go, you'll be free to move on. The enemy of your future is your present and your past. Past experiences can undermine your future. So you need to let your past go. Forgetting those things that are behind, you got to press on toward what? A higher calling, a higher place. You're going forward to get free from your past. God does not dwell in the past. Now, faith is operating. You got to believe now. You got to walk in the eternal now. Deal with things as they are today. Because one thing you can be assured about people, they're going to change. Folk don't stay the same, they get better or worse. You married them for better and for worse, and they got worse. See, that's how it goes. <laughs> and see, so you can't control another person. You might marry somebody with the best of intentions, thinking, oh, this is the happiest day of my life. It's beautiful and all of that. See, a wedding is not a marriage. It's not the same thing. It's like Kyle and Nikki. Y'all get, they get married in September. Y'all stand up right. This is a nice couple going to get married in September. <laughs> Y'all be, y'all be praying for them. Pray for them because marriage is an important endeavor. It's a big step. But they'll come down the aisle. Nikki will look like the top of a wedding cake. Everybody, oh, your dress is beautiful. Your hair is lovely. All of that right there. But then you go home and close the door. Man, get it for real. <laughs> See, because everything ain't going to be lovely every day. It's going to be some changes, some stuff you don't see the same. But see, the focal point got to be Jesus Christ. See, if you make him the focal point, everything else will level out. But if you deal with the person on the horizontal, trying to make him see it your way and all of that, you'll never make it. My wife and I have been married 
35 years next year. 35 years? 35 years. But the reason why we stayed married so long is because she prayed for me. I prayed for her. I know it's things she prayed for me about that I never, I never known. That she can see in me what's wrong with me, and she'll intercede for me, and I never know it. See, a lot of your wives do that. They see that you're crazy, <laughs> but they never tell you you're crazy. They've just been taking it to the Lord, and they're seeing you change, and thank you, Lord. And, <laughs> that nut, stop doing that. Thank you. All right. Then you go on to the next thing on the prayer list that you got hidden under your mattress that nobody knows about, you know. What was that, what was that movie, War Room? That's, that's how you got to do it. And on the same token, the guy got to do the same thing for his wife. See, that's how you overcome things without maligning people because you told them, if you tell them face to face, a lot of times they can't take it or they can't handle it or it won't be received right. So don't have to tell everybody everything. You win the battle on your knees. That's where the battle is won, on your knees. If you don't know that, you don't understand what it's all about. So, you learn over time to let things go. I found out that anything that was a big deal in the morning is no big deal by nighttime. It didn't even matter. What you were talking about had no significance whatsoever. You were just trying to get somebody to see it your way and trying to influence them to, you know, go along with you and all of that stuff. But if you stop caring about all this down here, you won't have too many arguments. You know why? Because I don't care. I don't care what you do because I don't care about this. I don't even want to be down here. I don't even like it down here. So if you bring something to me about down here, I, I don't care about that. You know what I heard? I don't care what you heard. <laughs> you saw what they did in the service? I didn't see them, and I don't want to know what they did. <laughs> because you'll find out it doesn't matter. None of these things move the apostle because none of it matters. It's all in your head. It's a big deal in your own head. That's why you got to let that stuff go and cast down those imaginary kingdoms in your head. That's how you get over it. And then you can enjoy life. My wife and I, we can go and hang out, man, go on trips together. We don't need anybody else around. We go shopping and fooling around, go and eat ice cream, go to the beach. You know, you don't need other folk around when you're all right. But, you know, people hide out around crowds because they don't really get along. So everywhere they go, they got to have a crowd because you really can't stand the person. So you got to have a crowd. Let's, let's go and get three and four other couples and your cousin and my auntie and everybody. And we can just hide out in the crowd because really I don't get along with you and I don't even like you. So I need a crowd. But boy, when you get over there and you really got a relationship and a covenant cup with somebody, you don't need a crowd. So, you know, that's what you, that's what you want God to do in your relationships with a husband or a wife is be all right and not need validation and not need to be needed and not need somebody to see it your way and trying to shape them and forge them into what you say they should be and let God shape them and forge them into what he made them. Women got to learn one thing, you know, God made man. Woman didn't make man. A woman came out of the rib of a man. How could you make a man when you weren't even there? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I got an idea about how he has to be, and I'm going to forge him into my image of what I say a man should be like. He's going to resist that. You've been picking up that resistance because you're trying to do what only God can do. If you get out of the way and let God build a man, you'll find out that God will build a man better than you would have because you don't even know what you want nor need. You got a bone head, so you need somebody to sometime drill down on that bone head of yours to make you stop acting like that. Because what's happening is you might be mad right now, but long term you're respecting because he didn't bow the knee to you. So you do all that jumping around. <laughs> Girl, you're going to jump all day long. I ain't moving one inch. You heard what I said. That's how it's going down. I need some flapjacks, some bacon, and some scrambled eggs, and a cup of coffee. And don't forget the cream and the raw sugar. <laughs> Hallelujah. They'll walk away. 
and get that scowl off of your face. <laughs> but down the road of peace, you know what they're going to think? I can't move that joke. Go on, go on. And yet, once you get over all that, you'll be all right. Because you know you got what? A secure guy, a man. Not a boy, not somebody you can manipulate, all that other stuff. You finally met yourself a man. I'm telling you, man, that's what we forge guys to be at the band up. Stop bowing the knee to your wife. She's jumping all around and hiccuping about you coming down here. Let her keep hiccuping. Because, hey, somebody got to do what? Stand. Something's right and something is wrong, and I'm making my stand. I wasn't born with you. I need one person to make it, the Lord. I love you. I want you, but I don't need you. That's the way it goes. People, that's so cold-blooded. You don't need somebody that needs you. If you're all they have, they got nothing because you're going to die. If you're all they have, then what are they doing? You're not around. If they're totally crippled and dependent upon you, that's a mess. You want to know that guy's a man when you're not around. That way you know no other woman is seducing him. Because he's a faithful man, with or without me, he stays the same. That's the kind of guy you really want. So you see, God is building a family of people that have come out from amongst this world that he can trust. It's one thing for you to trust God. It's another thing for God to trust you. God wants to trust people. And he tests you to show you where you're inconsistent and he can't trust you yet. That's what you go through. That's the cycles you go through. When you fall into sin, it's telling you about yourself that God can't trust me because I'm still going to be susceptible to sin. So he can't trust me. So you got to know within the confines of your own soul what you're feeling. You monitor yourself. That's why he says to examine yourself to see if you be in the faith. I'm going to show you the differences in people that make you faithful as opposed to not being faithful. God is looking for consolidation and amalgamation of his church. He wants the church to be identified. The church is going to be persecuted, but the church is going to end up glorified, and then the church will be enthroned. So the church must, first of all, stand up, Ezekiel 37, as an army, and the world will do what? Identify it. That's the church. That's the real church. Then they'll begin to persecute the real church. And then we're going to go through the processes of persecution. It's all planned out by God. He's going to filter us through all of this. After persecution, he will glorify us. He's going to give us the same glory that Jesus Christ had. The gifts will be in full operation and we'll be bearing the jewels that we that was born out by Isaac's wife. What happened? The name of the servant went out to get a bride for Isaac. Went out and got Rebecca. As soon as you get Rebecca, she was adorned with what? Gifts, jewelry. She had all this expense. That's the gifts of the spirit. That identified her as Isaac's bride. She was glorified by the gifts and led by the spirit back to Abraham and Isaac. Abraham and Isaac were types of the father and the son. So the Holy Ghost is out here as an invisible, nameless servant gathering up the bride. That's all he's doing. He gathering up the mem members of the household of God as God is causing us to engage in a family reunion. He's bringing in his family. He already knows who's saved, but he won't let us know. God knows everybody already saved from the foundation of the world. He already identified them down through the centuries. He knew everybody's going to get saved, but he won't tell us. We got to be what? Walking by faith and obedient and hearing. What does he do that? Because that's the thing that has us moving toward him to need him. If he gave us all the information, we just, oh, he, oh they, they scared you to be saved anyway, so I can just say it. <laughs> No, man, we got to be engaged with him so he can actually work through us to do his bidding. And you know what that does? That makes us tighter on him and couples us deeper into him. Because we're seeking him to actually to be joined to him tighter. That's why he has us walking by faith and not by sight. He knows, but he won't tell us. 
You got to seek him. You got to pray. You got to fast. You got to deny this flesh. You got to fight your way through this on a daily basis. You have to deny yourself every day and take up a cross to walk with God. Although he knows the outcomes, we still have to go through what? The process. We use that word a whole lot around here, the process. And after this arena is over and we make it through, he'll enthrone us. We'll be seated in heavenly places with Christ, enthroned, and his family unit will be, will be complete because his only begotten son will welcome his other family members in and you'll have a family reunion. Everybody will be together in the heavenlies. And you understand now heaven is coming down to displace the earth. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. So all of this is going away only to be replaced and displaced by a new arena where righteousness will indwell it. So it's going to be a heaven and earth, but it just won't be this. This is going to be dissolved and replaced. <clears throat> so if your focal point becomes, hey, I want to be a part of this. See, all salvation is saying, you know what? I get the heavenly vision. I see what he's about. And I want in on this. That's the simplest salvation gets. Then you say, well, how do I get in on this? You have to be born again. You have to be birthed by the spirit and get in the body of Christ to be a part of God's family, to be a part of this reunion. You got to ask yourself how many of us are really committed for this thing to become real in us. I mean, how committed are you for it to really happen to you as opposed to just paying lip service to it and going to church and singing songs and doing the gymnastics? Who wants to qualify for God to actually live through them to achieve his purposes? You identify with God for who he is and what he is as a father. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 9. He says, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we, were, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? So that tells us God is a patriarch. In a reunion, there's always the patriarchs of the family at the reunion. You know, you go over there and it'd be two older people sitting in a chair off to the side. You know, in their 90s, you know, late 90s or something. These are the patriarchs. Everybody serves them. That's my great granddaddy. That's my great great granddaddy right there now, y'all. Get granddaddy's plate. You know, go over there and see what granddaddy need, you know. You know, you know, grandmama, she can't walk too much. Y'all go and get her chair now and bring her chair over there. She like to sit out there under that tree with them grandkids. Y'all go get a chair now. Go sit right there with you and see what she needs. See if she wants something to drink. It's kind of hot out here. Yeah. See, those are the patriarchs. God is a patriarch. So therefore, he, he's do what? Respect, reverence, honor. That's why you come correct to him. He's a patriarch. See, every, you got to know this. The invisible things are more real than the visible. See, everything down here is a pattern. For the heavenly. So if you get, uh, get the, the, the revelation of what heaven is like, it's going to come through you studying what you see. It's a pattern. And you can almost get a complete revelation of heaven by looking at earthly patterns. The invisible things are revealed by the things that are seen. So God is an eternal patriarch enthroned as a king. Jesus is a prince to God's king. But Jesus is our king. See, to God the Father, Jesus is a prince. He's a prince of peace. But from our perspective, he's our king. So looking upstream from Jesus, you got God the Father as a king and Jesus as a prince. Looking upstream from us, we got Jesus as a king. And we are the a kingdom of priests. It really doesn't say we're kings of priests. We're a kingdom of priests. What do we do? We offer up sacrifices as priests. What's the sacrifice? Praise. We offer up. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. So that's what we offer up in heaven. It's no longer bullets and goats and animals. It's going to be praise offered up. 
And Jesus is the high priest of praise. Jesus has a lot of offices. The priest, prophet, king, all these things are in play. And you find out when a man assumes his righteous role as a Christian, he becomes a prophet, priest, and king in his home. See, this identity got to be ingrained in you. Most guys didn't come up in a home life, in a family life, where that was modeled for them. So they know nothing about it. All they knew was, find me a couple of babes, try to slam them tonight, get me some dope and a drink, and sleep it off in the morning. That's about the maximum you had in the street. Prophet, priest, and king, I don't even know what that is. So they got to be reformatted. They got to be transformed by being taught how to be a man. God has to rebuild the man. He rebuilds a man in Christ. He rebuilds the woman in Christ. It has to be redone. Ephesians chapter 3. We're talking about a family reunion, y'all. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family is in heaven and earth is named. <clears throat> the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We're all under the patriarchal headship of the Father. Everybody. So you bow your knee to him in reverence to this eternal patriarch. The devil, as a servant of the household, rebelled against the head of the household, the patriarch, and he threw him out. So if you want to be thrown out, just don't reverence the patriarchs. My thing is, sell it in my heart that God is better than me, God is more than me, and God is higher than me. That's just the way it is. And you just bow the knee. Don't contend with him. Accept who he is and just walk in it. Ephesians 5. Verse 20, 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So you see how it's modeled after the heavenlies on earth. God the Father, God the Holy Ghost, God the Son, the triune family unit of God is modeled on earth as a family. Father, mother, child. It's the same triune setup. That's the image of God. He made man in his image. The image is the family unit. So what does the devil attack? The family unit. He tries to dissect and destroy the family unit. Who's the target in the family unit? The kids. It's the children. That's why he wants what in a family? Discord. Confusion. No order, because he can get in through disorder and chaos to destroy the kids. He's always after the next generation. The devil targets the next generation. You got to know that. So you'll build up barriers and protections against it. And like I say, the, the battle is won on your knees. It's, it's won in prayer. You got to know now we're in a real strategic time now. Moves are being made. It's a master chess game going on. And you got to know that moves are always being made. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the what? The household of God. God has a what? A household. You have a household. God conducts his household in an orderly fashion, just like you would. The church is really an organized organism. It's not held to skelter. It has order. I always say that we come in here independently interdependent. You never lose your individual identity. Never try to make a child lose their identity because they got to be themselves. But they just got to obey you. The worst thing you'll do to a child is this right here. You'll try to mold them based on 
your heartache from your own sin. I don't want them to be like me. I was a whore. I was used up. I was out there getting dogged by men. And you're trying to stop your daughter from being like that. But guess what? You're walking by fear and not by faith. It ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. because Whatever's not a faith is what? Sin. So you're looking at what you did and you're trying to make her not be what you were. And guess what she's going to become? Just like what you were. It's a trick of the devil. He tricks you. And you're putting forth all this effort to make sure she got better than me. She got the best of this and the best of that. You know what happens? You get the best of everything. You don't appreciate none of that. You don't appreciate it. You had some hard knocks in your life. So when you got a little bit of something, you were grateful. I finally got myself a pair of good shoes. I was so sick of these holy shoes. I know he said, be ye holy as I am holy. But I ain't know he meant shoes and pants. See, <laughs> so you're trying to compensate by giving them the best. Got a silver platter in front of them. They spit on the platter. It's like a woman that finally get a good man and she can't even appreciate it. Have you ever seen a woman like that? She finally get a good dude, homebody, don't go anywhere, cut the grass, washing the cars on the weekend. Then he said, babe, I'm going to grill a couple of steaks tonight. Oh, you know, what you want with your steak? I'm going to grill. I'm going to grill, give you a break. You know, I'll, I'll take care of all of that. You know, I'll grill, clean up the kitchen. You just relax tonight. Just go in there and get you something to drink and, you know, kick back and all hell of things. And she's somewhere crazy. Can't even appreciate. Finally got a decent dude and she's somewhere crazy. So don't go nowhere, ain't running the street with his boys, ain't fooling around out there with other women. A decent dude, and now you flipping out. And you better know some other women saying, if she go, she better, yeah, okay. She don't play them cards right. <laughs> See, that's why you better be thankful for what you got. God serves it up on a silver platter, you spit on the platter. That's crazy. A lot of folks want to get, think they want to get married, but they're not even ready to get married because the inner man is not right yet. They couldn't even take it. Did you know you can be programmed not to be treated good? You can be programmed not to be treated good. And you know what you'll do? You'll keep doing things till somebody treats you bad. What program is running in you? Rejection. It's a rejection program. You'll keep acting a complete fool until somebody cuss you out. But then the feeling of rejection is your normal. See, that feeling you get that makes you feel rejected, that's what you are programmed to walk in. That's why you got to be made whole and get every program that's foreign to God out of you. Because you'll be doing things that are totally crazy and nobody can figure out what are you doing. It's a rejection program running. When it's quiet and peaceful, everybody getting along, you got to do something to stir up something because you reject it. It's, it's, it's a crazy thing to watch, but it's real. That program running can undermine your whole life. First Timothy chapter three. First Timothy chapter three, verse 15. But if I tarry long, that you may know how you ought to do what? Behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. That you may know how to behave yourself in the house of God. Did you not know when the church gets together like this, we're in the assembly of God? It's the household of God coming together to deal with the father as a family unit. And it's a way to behave yourself in the household. When you gather together, there are governing ordinances in the household of God. One would be like talking in tongues with an interpreter, stuff like that. If the prophets speak, let them speak two or three in order. And uh, the other prophets judge what's being said to see if it's, if it's of God. See, all these things are, are, are in play in the household of God. So first of all, to see us walk in this, we got to, uh, first of all, convene, convene the household. What's the matter in church is the household is not convened, 
because we got family-run businesses mimicking the household of God. It's not the kingdom of God. God is not the father over it. Jesus is not Lord, and the Holy Spirit is not allowed to flow, so the household has not been convened. That's what we got to change, and that's why we got to reorder the household so God can move again. We want to see this thing really happen and not pay lip service to it. In a household, in your family unit, there are basically three basic relationships you'll see. The first one is parents with the children. Never be a person or a, a mother and father that shows discord to your children. Don't show disagreement to your children because you know what they're going to do? Shoot, we got it made up in here. They ain't even on the same page. We can get that to complete fool up in here. That's what, they, that's what they're going to do. If they pick up discord and disunity in your midst, they're going to flip out because they're going to know nobody governing me. They're going to know it. They're going to know it automatically. If you got something you got to discuss, don't let that child sit there and look in your mouth. So they just slap us down for that. You and grown folk bending in your mouth. Pow! Get on out of here, boy. I was just trying to hear. I was just trying to hear what y'all was saying. I, I don't even mean no harm. <laughs> you ever seen a kid that jump into grown folks' conversation? Boy, woo you talking about a high tanning, Jack. You open your mouth, well, I don't think we need to, pow, 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 pow. <laughs> I, was just try, I was just trying to give a little input. I was just trying to make my point out. Head going east and west, north and south. Because you got no business getting into grown folk business. Carry your behind outside and get that baseball bat and that glove and go on down to the playground somewhere. You stay in a child place. You understand me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go back, turn him into one of them, you know, little rascals. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Like you on a plantation somewhere. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Show see it. Yes, sir. Y'all see it. Yes, sir. I sure see it now. I didn't see it before. Yes, I'm, I, I sure see it now. That reprimand of the backhand sure got my attention, you know. <laughs> but that's how they do it. They, they, didn't, they didn't mince words with you back in the day, y'all. Now, Billy, time out. That y'all go stand in the corner for about, that thing, know he running on something. Because he just wear you out. They learn to wear you down, being tenacious. That timeout stuff don't work. So you got to have a good parent-child relationship. Romans 8. We always go on excursions through the Bible. Have you, under, you understand we teach the Bible, right? <laughs> we don't teach theories and what we think, and we don't read two scriptures and then start tuning up. You got to teach the Bible, man. Stop all that tuning up. Romans 8. Verse 16, he says, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So we're children of God. You got to see yourself as a child of God. So God, as a father, looks out for his children. You got to know that. You can't think that. You can't wonder about it. You got to know God is always working good for you, whether you can see it or not. If you go through something, it's for your good. It might be hard, but he's taking you through it for your good. On the back end of it, you'll find out it was good. But you got to go through and trust God that he knows what he's doing. Sometimes it's hard to do it because you're looking at circumstances that are austere. But on the back end of it, God is still a good God. And he won't do anything to his children to harm them. First John. First John. First John, take a look at chapter three. First John chapter three. First John three, verse one. He says, behold. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. 
Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So there's a spirit man in you there's a, that is a bright, shining one. Spirit beings in the, in the spirit world that are, that are born again light up. They illuminate. And Jesus comes glorified. He's a glorified being. And you're going to be a glorified being. You're going to see yourself for the first time like you really are. It's going to be shocking to really see yourself for what you really are. As a glorified, illuminated one. A light being. This is going to be a wild time, you know, when you go to heaven. Matthew 7. Be glad to get out of here, that's for sure. Matthew 7, verse 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good gifts, good things to them that ask him? Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them? For this is the law and the prophets. So if you want good, do good. God is reciprocal. If he sees you pouring out to do good to people, he'll do good to you. He's trying to train us to get off of us. Why? The glue that holds the Godhead together is what? Selflessness. So if you want to be yoked to God, become selfless like God. Take no thought for your life. Think about the other person. Why is God sending us through marriages? He's teaching us selflessness. Every step in marriage is a step of selflessness. You get married to your wife, you got to be selfless. You have kids, you really got to be selfless at 2 o'clock in the morning. Because <laughs> don't nobody want to get for that 2 o'clock feeding. And that's what both of y'all lay in the bed like looking at the ceiling Did somebody finally say, you hear the baby? <laughs> no. I... <laughs> we got a baby. You see, it's just crazy. <laughs> a baby will beat you down. 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 See? <laughs> see I talked about them and they... Why you want to jump on us like that? But they will. They'll beat you down. And you have two or three. Woo-woo, boy. So I had triplets. I can't even imagine having triplets. And a lot of times, the, the, the mother walk around in a coma. Just... <laughs> Luann. <laughs> Luann Poopy. You know. Just walk around in a coma because she just be through just all night. One go to sleep, the other one wake up. And you just walk around. Call your mama. Let her watch them for at least two hours. I got to get some kind of rest. Please call somebody. Help somebody help me. <laughs> please, please. Do y'all have any mercy? Call the sisters in the church. Can somebody come over here? Please. Please. Please come help me. You know, because a baby will beat you down. See, folks who haven't had babies, I want to have eight kids. Okay. Okay. God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> because it's a rough ride, but you know, it's a blessing of the Lord, and the children are his reward, like Barbara said. So, you see, now that relationship of parents with children is ever present. The Bible talks about us being children by way of birth and adoption. You know that? There's two ways to become a child in a household birth and adoption, and the Bible covers both of them. We're by born again, and we're adopted and joined as with the firstborn, Jesus Christ through adoption, and yet we're born again too. So we're in the household hard. We're adopted and born. You're in. All you got to do is remain faithful to the Father, and he'll see us through anything. 
If you remain faithful to the Father, he will see you through it. We've had people come here, man, all along the trail that fall into sin. We never respond to sin like that. Like, you're going to hell. Now get up from there. Get that mess off of you. Wash it off of you and keep going. Jesus said, I prayed for you that your faith fail not. Don't become introspective. Don't be so burdened down by your sin that you give up. Get yourself up from there. Wash yourself off and keep going. There's no human that's going to try to put you down if they got any sense because nobody wants to see anybody go to hell. Hell is too much to bear, man, in my mind to see somebody go to hell forever and never get out. I can't even process that. So we're not here to put people in hell. We're here to get it off of you, get you free so you make it in. But a lot of people see what we do as negative because we dig into the human heart where the filth is. So, man, that's just, that's just so hard, man. You don't know what I've done. And you all down in there trying to get it. I don't want nobody touching that. I don't want to bring it up. I don't, you got to deal with it to get rid of it. You got to acknowledge your transgressions to dismiss them. Don't go around the process. Let the surgery happen to you because you want to make it in for real and you don't want to become religious. The only thing you'll do when you don't deal with your sin is you'll become religious. You'll just make the mental adjustment to act out what you're not because you don't want to deal with the inside of you. Then you're the one preaching to everybody about how they should be. That's when I become a false prophet. I become a cult leader. All because you don't want to deal with what's inside of you. So you'll find other people like you to reinforce the fact that they don't want to deal with themselves either. See, everybody who don't want to deal with the inner court, they become religious outer court people blaming everybody for their circumstances. No. If Jesus Christ can be my only answer, if I interact with him, anybody can be made free if they get with just him. So who's to blame? Nobody. See, there's, there's no excuse for this. We can get out of anything if we come to God correctly. He made a way of escape. The Bible says he will make a way of escape that you'll be able to endure it no matter what it is. So there's a parent-child relationship in play. The next relationship is child-to-child -child relationships. It's, it's when you and your siblings interact with each other. And the number one thing a parent teaches the siblings is to be what? Unselfish. Share that toy with him. What you doing? Don't, don't be taking that from your little brother like that. Give that to her. It's because they'll have 20 trucks and just all of them. Just, you can't play with all those by yourself. You got all those trucks. Give one of them to him. That's church people 101. See, when you come into church selfish, you come in only self-aware and always monitoring how somebody treats me. Man, that's, that's poison. That's, that's, that stinks in the, in the church. Everybody got to be centrally focused on you, and you think everybody's looking at you, evaluating you, when nobody's even thinking about you. But in your mind, I'm the central focus of everything, so therefore I'm the central focus of everybody else. And nobody even cares. You got to get free from that selfishness. That's a child-to-child -child interaction. Philippians 2. This is a, the second relationship. It's three basic relationships. The second one is child-to-child. -child. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 3. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. That's the child-to-child -child relationship. Everybody's better than me. Everybody needs to be served. Everybody needs to be helped. If everybody got that outflow going, man, everything would just knit itself together all by itself. But you, but you know what happens when you're wounded, you got 100% inflow. You got a vacuum inside because I got a wound. So I got inflow. I need help. I need to be healed up. I need you. I need you to help. I need me. I need you. 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 
man, you'll drive yourself crazy with all that inflow. Outflow, you'll normalize all by yourself. It'll make you normal. It'll make you over again all by yourself by becoming selfless and letting the outflow take over. I'm telling you, it's the way out of a lot of bondage. And you can't fake this. It's got to happen to you. You got to let God come in and create that outflow by filling the vacuum. You fill that vacuum and the result will be outflow. A wounded heart, a wounded spirit, you're going to have inflow and you're going to be self-conscious and you walk around with everybody on the outside supposedly caught up on you because it's in your own mind. When people are trying to interact with you and love you, but you can't even receive love. You can't do it because you got all that inflow going on. And everything they do is it's just like it's any little slight thing it's like a big deal. How, they said this to me, and it, it just, I saw how they said that to me. What you talking about? So you came up in our neighborhood. Everybody in our neighborhood talked rough. And you just blew it off, you know. Hey, man, what's wrong with you? And you, you didn't think nothing of it. We would fight and beat each other half to death, and 20 minutes later be somewhere playing football or something. Nobody cared. And don't play sports. They try to kill you. We played on the asphalt in the street and tackled each other on the street. That's how crazy it was. The sideline was where you hit. You know, there's grass over there, but you hit full board with no pads on in the street. I think, Dick, you busted all your teeth one time, didn't you? <laughs> I mean, them joker would jack you. I mean, you learned that. You learned real fast in our neighborhood. It's just the way it is. The Lord of the jungle out here, kill or be killed. And you became like them. You just became dirty. Because if you didn't, they would take advantage of you. So you learned to fight. You had to fight. I don't care how big you were. You fight guy bigger than you. It didn't matter. As long as they knew you would fight, they'd leave you alone. But if you wouldn't fight, I got a message on the internet called, I remember Derek Livingston. Y'all ever heard that? I remember Derek Livingston because I went out to the neighborhood green and Derek Livingston just made my life a living hell. Until one day I got a tree branch. I almost beat Derek Livingston to death. From that point on, guess who I didn't have a problem with? Derek Livingston. And every time I saw him, I'd be looking at him crazy. <laughs> like I was all, I mean, what you say, Derek? Let me see. What you say? Just act crazy all the time, see? And they leave you alone. They'll say, that's it. Leave him. He crazy. Leave him alone. That's what you, they'll leave you alone then, see? But as long as you just mush mouth around and cow down to them, boy, they put the, the pedal to the middle. That's the same way the devil is. You know that God is letting the devil push you around until you do what? Stand up and fight. Lord, Lord, please. Lord, please, the devil just beat me down and the devil just saying things about me. And Lord, please, Lord, please, Lord, please. He just ignoring all that. Stand up and fight him. Lord, please, don't make me fight him, Lord. Don't make me, Lord, please. He's going to make you put up your dupes. And fight that joker. Because he said what? I've already overcome him. But you got to do what? Exercise your rights. You got you to enforce what I won. I got the victory, but you got to enforce it. We're enforcers. That's why we don't back down from the devil. I don't care how much stuff people say about this. We keep pounding them. Because in the end, guess what? We win. We overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, and we love not our lives unto death. I preached another message. We're not losing, we're just leaving. The losers are on earth when we leave them here. Because they're going to be down here with the Antichrist. We'll be gone. Si sipping some ambrosia. You know, ambrosia is the drink of the gods in Greco-Roman mythology. 
But whatever they drink in heaven, did you realize that the marriage supper of the Lamb will have food in it? You wonder, what do y'all eat up here? You know, the Bible talks about angel food. Not a cake, but real angel food. <laughs> I think they eat for enjoyment in heaven because I don't believe you need to eat. But they just eat to enjoy a meal. It's going to be a marriage supper. It's going to be food. It's going to be for real. The invisible spirit world is more real than the seen world. So you see now, child-to-child relationships have to be made that we can adapt to each other and walk with each other. Now, if you get into a relationship with a person in the body of Christ, let's say you want to get married, that means two of God's children have decided to get married. If you're not married and fornicating, you are committing what? Incest. You're in an incestuous relationship in the household of God. You're just nasty. You're a defiling element in the household of God because you're an incest. An incestuous relationship in church with your sister. You can't get lower than that. That's rock bottom. Rock bottom. Preachers with all these women. Incest with a daughter in the Lord. Incest in the household of God. So you see now, we've got to see this thing reordered. What happens? In relationships. When you relate to people right, then you relate inner court to inner court when you deal with a person. In other words, spirit to spirit communion. That's the first step. You see, love has to be broken down into different dynamics. There are different meanings to love. You got agape, which is a spiritual inner court love from your spirit. You got phileo, which is the soulish love, which is brotherly love. We get this, the city of Philadelphia from it the love of a brother and a sister. Then you get eros, which is erotic love expressed through a sexual union. So you got to understand that all these dynamics can play themselves out in the household of God as you get closer to somebody. But here's the problem right now that we got to overcome in church to make all of us walk in righteousness in the household of God. How the world trained us to think. You got to have your mind what? transformed and renewed if you don't it won't work you can make it start off working but it's not going to last because the thing is not anchored in the spirit you got to get married in the spirit and then let it bleed out to the other areas the first equation the first part of it is to be engaged in phileo you got to be a brother and a sister to marry somebody first. If you're not a brother and a sister and you start with erotic love, eros, sexual love, you got defiled love. You started wrong. You started backwards. You work from the outside in instead of the inside out. When your spirit man is right, you have the ability to express what? Phileo. Because you're flowing from the inside out. You start off with physical love, erotic love. Then what has just happened is this. You as a woman have been objectified. And the guy's not marrying somebody. He's marrying something. And guess what? You won't be precious. You won't be holy. And you won't be valuable to him. And he'll treat you like that. You'll basically be a glorified slut. Now, if you got married like that, then what happens is there's no value appended to you. And he don't treat you worth nothing. So you make a request, and you just the whole talking to me. Now, guys have been trained to lust after women. They objectify them. And all they see is a banging body and a banging booty. That's it. But when you come down to, baby, uh, I was thinking. You was thinking, ho. What you talking about? No ho got nobody thinking nothing for me, to me. Be telling me making no request like that. I ain't going out my way for you, ho. I'm married to you. I put a ring on you. I gave the whole a ring. Beyonce said, put a ring on it. I did it. But I don't plan on you talking to me and want to spend no time with me and be my friend and be up under me like that. No, I don't want to go walking in no park or walking through the mall window shopping and all that. 
What you think this is? You just an object. You was just a dying piece on my arm. I just got you as just in a, a little part of my, my deal. You know, you buy, you buy a suit, and then there's a tie and cufflinks and stuff. What are those? Accessories. You was just an accessory for the fellas to ooh and ah over you. I didn't want you like that. Ho. Guy, a guy is programmed like that in the streets. A woman is an object. She's not a person. And if they marry you like that, you'll be objectified and you won't have much to operate with. And if you're trained to be objectified, then you get married objectified. And you settle for being nothing the rest of your life and you adapt to it. And you can live 20, 30, 40, 50 years like that. That old program has to be eradicated. You'll find a guy that runs a lust program can't get with the righteous woman. It won't happen. Because he's required to be what? A man that's going to love you and he's, he can't love. Why can't he love you? Because he's full of lust. He only runs off of lust. So you'll be sitting there thinking, why don't these brothers, uh, no, ain't no brothers full of lust going to say nothing to you. Because he can't do what? He can't interact with you because you're foreign to him. Now you switch on to that whole program, then they're going to. Where you from? Hawaii, you say? <laughs> See? <laughs> But who wants to keep being that? Something, not somebody, which makes you a nobody. And the world runs off of that. Look at them. You think Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion and, and all these folks, Happy Nicki Minaj and Rihanna, poor Beyonce just been beat down to the ground trying to look like she's something she's not. That's pitiful to watch her. Something, not somebody. You know how you can tell? Because when they get married, they still got to get butt naked in public. That's why Russell Williams, Russell uh, uh, Wilson with uh, Sierra, Sierra can't stop being butt naked. Why? She's been objectified. She's something. What to be in public with your wife butt naked for, for universal consumption by everybody? Your private parts are designated by God to be with your husband alone. You know how vulgar it is for somebody to be in the inner temple as a woman. They've been inside of you, leaving the residue of themselves inside of you, which marks you as theirs. Every guy you have sex with outside of wedlock, you've been marked as their personal mate. You're their wife. And now they tell you, I'm going to wife you up. My wifey. That joker don't care if you live or you lay down and die. He depended on you being somebody that's something that's going to buy into that trash he's telling you so he can use you as a semen dump. That's all he's doing. Just like a guy got to take a whiz and got to run around to the restroom to do it, you just a latrine and a toilet. Maximum potential. That's why people don't like this message. <laughs> He's so graphic. It's just real. That's how it go. That's what happened to you. That's what all strippers are. Strippers are something. They're not somebody. You butt naked in a room of 800 guys with all of your private parts exposed so they can fantasize and lust over you and drop some money on you as something. They paying something to see your private parts. That's all they want to do. That program got to be a sponsor from church. That program is why you wonder what's wrong with a lot of guys. They don't have the ability to identify with a woman of God with a lust program running. And you know what they'll do to overcompensate? They stay away from the sisters. Just walk around it. Man, what is wrong with you? You're going to trip over your feet and kill yourself putting your feet in front of the other one like that. But what? They overcompensate. I'm full of lust 
And I don't want nobody in there to think I got no lust in me, although I got it, I'm full of it. So I try to pull a holy stunt and talk scripture all day. But if you free, you can hang around with the women and just goof off with them. Hey, Naima, what's up, girl? What's been going on? You been doing all right? You got that three-point thing out there. I saw you out there. You was, man, you was killing them. You know? That's how you talk to your sister. Ain't nothing going on. But with something going on, hey, hey, Kanisha, hey, hey there. <laughs> Crazy. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you got to be set free inside. You got to have that lust program extinguished as a guy. And you got to stop being objectified as a woman so you can interact with the household of faith without the bondage in play. Man, we're not here to see people that are not married stay unmarried forever, trying to do penitence for what they did in the past. That's why God wants to wash you free from all that trash and move on down the road. It ain't that hard. The last relationship is family with community what we express outside of church. So it's parent to child, child to child, family to community. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. The only God these folk can see is us. So if they walk into the household of faith and you find the same stuff in the world here, we got a pile of nothing to offer them because we're the same thing as them, doing the same silly stuff. It's time for God to have a family reunion. To have that family reunion, you gotta be, we got to be a sponge of all this stuff that's defiling us. That's why we preach deliverance. That's why we cast out demons. And that's why we preach messages like this to mortify the flesh. This is a flesh-mortifying message, along with casting out the demons that empower the flesh. Those two things working together will set you free and get you in right standing with God and man so your life can go on and you can live it. We want people to have full lives, productive lives, and to be able to live life without the bondage of the foreign entities the devil puts forth to control us. Man, we could be free as a bird if we stop trying to emulate the trash out there. I tell especially young girls, stop trying to be like them. These girls are miserable. You think Jennifer Lopez is, is happy being passed around like that? Are you serious? You think the Kardashians are really happy. Three or four babies in the home are still out there in thongs trying to show them behind everybody. That's because they're empty inside. Little Courtney got three babies at home and out there still butt naked. What's going to happen when those babies grow up and that's their mama? Those images don't go away. See, that's what I'm saying. Why pattern yourself after that trash? Let God make you over, give you a new life, rewrite the program in your mind, and move on downstream made whole. So we can be a part of God's family reunion. We had another video to show, but it's, it's so hot in here. I don't know why it's so hot. <laughs> huh? What did they say? Oh, they didn't make it, did they? Yeah. Yeah, because without this, without the heat, without that air conditioner cranked up, can't do it. Anyway, we had a video to show you. Truth United about what's happening to prepare for what's about to go down down here. To let you see exactly what they're doing and make preparations for it. He talked about storing up food, electrical generators getting ready for the next thing that's going to happen. As soon as we leave here, it's going to be on. They're going to begin to reorder the world, so begin to make preparations to get your life together and your home life together. And he, he suggests between six and eight months of food, water, and things of that nature. We're looking for amalgamation of the body of Christ because we have to be intertwined together to be interdependent. You know, if you, I don't have, you may have. If, I, if you don't have, I might have. You never know. We got plans Dante Remind is working on even doing his own gardening and setting up gardens to grow food. 
you, we don't know how it's going to unwind and unravel because they're pushing no vaccine, no interaction real strong right now. You know that the, uh, the uh, virus just broke out amongst the Minnesota Vikings. That's where you're from? And the Vikings head coach said, that's why we need to get vaccinated. Now, how are you making that connection? When some of the vaccinated people are getting the, the virus. I thought it protected you from the virus. See, all this right here is a bunch of junk. The goal is to get that shot. Because there's something else they're after. So my thing is this. We need to look at it from God's perspective and make ready, make plans, real tangible plans to be in a survival mode for a limited amount of time because it's going to culminate in a rapture and a mark of a beast. So we're just trying to harvest as many as we can while we got time. That's the only role we play. It's not longevity. It's no long-term plans. We're here to get a job done and evacuate the premises because you can tell very easily that the world is becoming uninhabitable. Look how hot it is. This room is lightweight. It's 106 degrees out west, 110, 115 some places. I mean, you can't even live in that. You try to walk three miles in that, you'll probably die on the way. So it's becoming an environment that's uninhabitable. So we got to make plans and make ready. But that, when you get home, go to YouTube, Truth, Truth Unedited. What's the name of that video, Tim? Okay, we know the collapse is coming. This is how you prepare. We know the collapse is coming. This is how you prepare. And he gives line by line instructions. Electrical generators. He said, uh, he said, I don't like guns, so I wouldn't have a gun because, you know, it, it's not right. He said, I, I, I keep a machete and a knife. I'd rather shoot a person than use a machete or a knife on them, wouldn't you? I'm thinking, like, what kind of logic is that? Then he said they can trace the fact that you have a gun and they'll know. It don't make no difference, man. You got a phone. They can trace you and know where you are with your phone. But see, all of this stuff is going down. We're in a whirlwind and it's coming on shore like a tsunami. You got to just relax, make the mental adjustments, let God infiltrate your soul and your mind. Do what he says. Stay calm. It doesn't matter. It's not a permanent residence anyway we're just passing through the bible calls us pilgrims what difference does it make it's not your world it's theirs just do what you do save as many as you can and get out that's what it's all about so our thing is this after knowing these things formulating plans for all of us to get together on the same page provide tools for the people that's got boots on the ground to bring in this harvest that's what omega ministries is all about a focal point to do the job we don't preach all this hierarchy stuff. There's no big use, little me's. There's no, uh, you know, preeminent ones. We want to see everybody productively engaged to carry out the will of God for themselves so that you get your reward when you get to heaven. That's what it's all about. We always culminate every conference with two things. We take up one offering. We don't take up an offering every day, you know. Then take up another one talking about, you know, we take up one offering on Sunday, ask you to do the best you can, we always hovering around $100,000 in the building fund until we get people to surge. It's got to be a, a broad platform of people that's harvesting people to make this thing surge. It won't work with just us. You see the people that are around us. The folk you see laboring around us, they labor doing everything that they do is unto the Lord. Waiting for the rest of the body of Christ to actually kick in and let's go. So we wait in circle waiting for folk to come alive out of religion into the church for real. Knowing that the church is me. I don't go to it. I'm it. I don't go to church. I go out from church to do the job on the ground. See, when that, cha when that change finally hits you, man, you change up inside. I'm not looking to follow anybody. I'm looking for them to follow me. So you got to be in it like that. It's got to be your thing. So we're going to take up an offering real fast. Do the best you can if you're given by way of the Internet. Give through the Omega Ministries website, click on support, then donate, mail it to post office box 960146, Riverdale, Georgia 30296, 
or use our cash app, which is dollar sign soldiers three four five, dollar sign so soldiers three four five. Do what you can, and we want to see people on a weekly, monthly basis stay consistent and giving. You know, we are we always searching. We put in several offers on permanent locations, but these folks want more money than what it's worth because um, this uh, commercial property is not worth what they think. Because when we get the estimations done and they go and do the um, appraisals, it don't appraise for what they're saying. And we can't, we can't even get money if we got a loan for what you're saying because the bank won't give it because it won't appraise. And so a person is thinking they're in the 1970s economy and in the 1970s world, but your, your property ain't worth that, fella. You know why? Because Amazon is scarfing up the retail business and they're becoming the central location to actually distribute everything. You're going to buy everything from diapers to your food with a click of a mouse. And then they're going to drop it using driverless vehicles, drones, and all kinds of technical upgrades governed by AI using the GPS satellite system to bring stuff to your house. We're moving into a whole nother paradigm. This is the 22nd, 23rd century we're going into as far as technology. So you got to get accustomed to the fact that what you once knew has gone away. I guarantee you, most of your white dresses came over the internet. You didn't go out to no dealers or nothing. Click, they dropped it. You might have had it pressed. That's the, that's the most you did. So this is what we're moving into. You don't see these huge distribution centers they're building everywhere? That's for, that ain't just being done. What idiot would build something that big for nothing? The plan is unfolding, y'all. We got to change into a, 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 we're basically a fighting force behind enemy lines. That's what we are. We've been dropped in behind enemy lines. We got to be sustained through logistical support to get a job done, and then we'll be extracted. Like you drop in Navy SEALs, do a job, then extract them out. That's what we are. So don't have any long-term plans. Don't look forward to longevity. If you get married, marry somebody that's in the war. Don't marry a civilian. Why you got to be praying? Uh, I'm trying to, you get up every morning praying. And I'm in here trying to get me some bread. And I hear you down there that praying in them tongues. Them old tongues. You should have never said I do to that. You see, don't marry a civilian. Do not marry a civilian. Marry a member of the militia. So you'll be on the same page on one accord. You got you to gotta see somebody's mind being vertical to the Lord to marry you. Don't let them be on, all under you. See if they got a prayer life. See how much they study to show themselves to prove. Do they read their Bible? Do they study their Bible? Do they have a relationship with the Lord for real? Evaluate that. Don't evaluate them liking me, all into me, want to hold me, because that's going to fail you. I'm telling you, man, it's going to be so rough and rigorous down here. You better be at the right place at the right time. I hope what we eat got air on. <laughs> for real. The other thing we do, y'all, is we anoint everybody with oil as we leave. We anoint everybody with oil and bless your life and ask God to take you to the next level. We want you to stay plugged in with Omega Ministries. We've been helping you plug in. Don't be a distant figure. We don't, we don't play, play that mess where you get clicks and stuff up in here. Everybody's the same to us. No matter where you come from, no matter what you are, no matter what race you are, we don't care if you're black, white, Hispanic, Oriental, we don't care. It's the household of faith. It's a family reunion. It's what it's all about. God is reuniting his family, and we all march under the blood-stained banner of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have one blood now. See, that's what it's all about. We need to be reunited. We got to come out of, out of a lot of religious bondage to be reunited with the family of God. Father God, we thank you for this time. God, we ask you to bless these that give. And God, as we depart here today, we want to anoint them and bless them as they go. We got a departure meal after this, y'all. After that, God bless you. But we're going to have another gathering sometime between now and March. You'll get the dates down later.
you know, we're going to find, we may find, it may be in Atlanta, it may be another location, but man, we ought to be six, seven times more than this by then. We'll let the numbers come to us as y'all talk to us about what you're doing. You know, prize women, I, mean, I got about 20 folk, man, I'm bringing in, I'm coming in hot. I don't know about the rest of the folk, but I heard what you said. I'm bringing about 20, 25 folk. I'm coming in hot. Man, I've been teaching the Bible study. We're going to bring the whole Bible study in. That's the way you want to be at. Don't, don't be somebody capped off somewhere, limited in your mind. Get your Bible study that's going. Get the tools you got at your disposal. Bring the harvest in. It, there is something good about expansion of numbers. Why? Because it's saying that the body is fruitful and multiplying. Jesus instructed us to be fruitful and multiply. That's a normal organic phase you go through. And that's when they trigger out there, when they see numbers gathering. That's a threat. But we want the threat on us. We want them to see us like that. Because now we are a threat because God is on the move. He's bringing in his family. And he's going to reorder everything around his will. That's what we want to see happen. So be a part of this, man. Be on the foundation. Be on the leading edge. Don't be a passenger in the, in the bus. Drive the bus. That's what it's all about. So let's take up a quick offering. Then we'll leave. As you leave, we'll anoint you out there. Is it cold out there? It's hot all around here? Oh, it is. Okay. So we'll anoint you as you leave the door. Rashid will be on one door. I'll be on the other one. And as you leave out, we'll anoint you with oil and bless you. Then we'll move over to the... Um, what time are we supposed to eat over there? 12.30. Okay, we eat 12.30 across the way at the other ballroom. Oh, it's going to be downstairs? Okay, we're going to be down, back downstairs again, y'all. By Loggerhead and Delfino's downstairs. Okay. So let's take a quick offering, y'all, and uh, then we'll move on before somebody passes out or something. We want to take time to acknowledge all the folks that helped out around here too, all the praise and worship team. It's hard to sing four days in a row, y'all. For real. Praise and worship team. Everybody helping in the hospitality suite, all the audiovisual people. And all of y'all, see, we, we can't do this without y'all praying. Somebody been praying. Y'all been doing some praying. Because it don't come together unless everybody get on one accord and everybody pray together. So, you know, we're not stupid. You know, if the devil can target one person and kill them, he'll knock out the whole thing. It got to be a group effort. Everybody got to be doing something. So don't think you come in here and everybody don't know what you're doing. We do. But I'm just telling you, we can up the action. We might as well bring this thing to a head. If they're going to come after us anyway, we might as well go out hot, fighting like a mad dog. You know what I'm saying? If you're going to get me, but I'm, I'm, it's going to be some return fire somewhere, I bet you. I'm not going to just lay here as a target. No, man. No, I'm not going to let them step up to me and tell me anything and I just buy it. No, man, I got it. Okay, I listen to you now. This is what I got to say about it. That's when they start shooting at you. You listen to them, but they want to kill you when you start. This ain't no one-way street, y'all. Stop being the one getting pushed around. I cordially listen to you. I'm, I'm very patient. I'm very polite. Okay, now I heard what you said. Now here's what I have to say. And that's when you got a problem. It ain't all incoming, y'all. It's got to be some outgoing, too, now. That's what it's all about. So let's get out of here before we burn up. Let's pray over the offering, and we'll call it a day. Boy, it's hot in here. Hey, there's some extra T-shirts back here, too, y'all. If you want to get a, some extra T-shirts, sometimes people want you to bring up some T-shirts and some polo shirts, books. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Father, give you thanks, Father, for another day, Father. We thank you, Father, for this journey, Father, that you got us on, Father. Father, we thank you for the offers, Father, for the, all the one that gave, Father, the one that didn't have to give, Father. 
But we know in your words, Father, you said we seek you first, your kingdom, your righteousness, and all these things that you know that we need, that you will add them unto us, Father. So, Father, we will give you the thanks, Father, and the glory, Father. We will continue to wait on you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.